Ram Neha from JNU New Delhi. And the title of my talk today would be the effect of HGT on the evolution of genetic code. So the main <coughs> idea being that genetic code not only serves as a translation mechanism, but also as an innovation sharing protocol with HGT providing feedback. So it would lead to a universalization and optimize, increased optimization level for the genetic code. And we've divided the genetic code evolution in two parts from the four amino acid stage to the 10 early amino acid stage, and from 10 to the standard genetic code. So the model, uh, actually we have a set of codes that are being uh, constrained on the basis of physicochemical hypothesis and the block structure of the genetic code by physicochemical uh, hypothesis, I mean that the genetic code evolved in terms of reduction of mutational and trans uh, translational errors. So the amino acids that are placed in the columns are placed in terms of physicochemical similarity. So what we have, we have a, a set of sequences in, each, in equal frequency that are translated using one of the codes that are in the constraint set. And those sequences are allowed to evolve by mutation selection like we normally do. The model for mutation here is the Duke Scanter model. And then you allow HGT with a finite probability. And whenever an HGT is taking place, you perform a code update. The code update is performed in a sense that it should at least maintain the fitness of the sequence that it has with its present code. And how do we calculate fitness? Uh, the fitness is calculated by comparing the fitness of the amino acid that is being translated using the present code and comparing it with the benchmark sequence, which would vary in accordance with the benchmark code that we are taking. And then the individuals in the next generation are chosen in probability proportional to fitness. And you, then we calculate the fixation probabilities for a, uh, for a number of trials. So the results so far are, uh, well, HGT doesn't exactly lead to one code, but it re uh, reduces the, com uh, the amount of codes or the number of codes that could be present in such a scenario. So as you can see here, these are the codes that uh, die within first few generations. And after that, there's only two, three, or sometimes seven, eight codes that will contain in the population. And why? Because the fitness increase is just a steep rise in the beginning. But after that, it stabilizes. So there's not much selection can do because the fitness level is same. So that's all. Hello, uh, I'm Pankaj. Uh, I work with SACON. Uh, we are working on an endemic owl species, uh, forest owl, like Heteroglox athene blaviti. Uh, so I have just started working, and uh, there is nothing much to show. But so we'll be, I'll be discussing some of the questions that uh, we are trying to address. So endemic species are uh, ecologically localized in certain geographical uh, extent. And as they are ecologically localized, it's very easy to uh, to do studies on phylogeography because it's easy to sample them across their range. Uh, forest owlet is one such case. Uh, it's morphologically very similar to Athenic Brahma spotted owlet. Here you can see the photograph. Uh, but it's not well supported. The forest owlet uh, has been placed in a new genus, Citroglox. Uh, so the taxonomy is not well resolved. And that is the first question that we are working on, where exactly forest owlets stand in the owl phylogeny. If you see the distribution of uh, Brahma and Blaviti. Uh, here the blue are Brahma and the red ones, if you can see, they are Blaviti. So if you can zoom in the red ones, uh, it appears there are three to four distant, specially distant populations of Blaviti, which are kind of uh, overlapping in distribution with the Brahma. So the next obvious question would be, uh, why this kind of pattern? Why Blaviti is so localized and Brahma is so widespread? So these kind of questions we are trying to address using the comparative phylogeographic framework wherein uh, the ecological and the evolutionary explanations can be derived from. Uh, so if high endemism and severe population fragmentation is the case, it is highly likely that the populations are highly inbred, which might uh, lead to extinction of species. Uh, so here in this picture, uh, I have plotted uh, the Blavity populations over uh, moist deciduous forest cover layer. Uh, so it basically shows the preferred habitat of the species and how they are distributed. 
So the so from the conservation point of view, it is uh, essential to understand whether the habitat structural connectivity. Uh, so if the functional connectivity is a function uh, of habitat structural connectivity, the, does it corroborate? And if it is so, then we can formulate some conservation measures. Yeah. So these are a few of the questions that we are working. Thank you. Uh, I'm Preeti from Atri. Uh, I'm working on conservation genetics of frogs from Central Western Ghats. Uh, Western Ghats, as you all might know, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and it's one of the biodiversity hotspots of the world. Uh, it, it, is, it, it stretches along 1,600 kilometers starting from the uh, border of uh, Gujarat till the southern tip of India, that's uh, Tamil Nadu. Uh, Western Ghats is a high proportion of uh, plant and uh, animal species. Uh, most of them not found anywhere else in the world. When it comes to amphibians, uh, Western Ghats has a high number of endemic species. Uh, till date, there are around 158 species of frogs, and the list is going to get increased. There have been many interesting studies on uh, frogs from India, especially in the field of phylogeography and some on ecology as well. Uh, most prominent being uh, a study which showed that uh, one of the frog family had a biogeogra biogeographical link with uh, seashells. There was one other work which showed that uh, one frog genus has a uh, it has a restricted movement because uh, it because elevation acts as a barrier and therefore it shows clade endemism. Uh, but when it comes to studying populations, not much work has been done from India. Also, Western Ghats has high number high uh, human density and uh, has been subjected to human uh, modifications like uh, modifications like land modifications, damming of rivers, uh, mining, etc. So this background led me motivated me to study uh, population genetics, especially of two endemic frogs from central Western Ghats. I'm looking into the population genetic structure and also um, uh, assessing the influence of landscape change on their genetic variability. I'm utilizing the com concepts of population genetics and combining them with lands landscape ecology concepts. Uh, my interest of species is to stream-dwelling frogs, Nictibetracus jog and uh, Nictibetracus kempolensis. The former is found in very few localities in central Western Ghats while the latter is found across the Western Ghats. I'm looking at a small scale, and I'm studying uh, two river basins, Aghanashni and uh, Sharavati. Uh, I'm into an initial stage of my sampling work and have uh, sampled in habitats like uh, evergreen forests, uh, uh, Miristika swamp, which are in itself a unique ecosystem, as well as in agriculture plantations. So, so I'm in a very initial stage of my sampling work. That's it. Hi, uh, I'm Prem from Utpal's lab. Uh, we work on various developmental processes that occur in plants. Uh, we use two model systems, Anthony and Mages, commonly called Snapdragon, and Arabsis. And today I'll be talking about uh, one of the uh, developmental processes, uh, that is leaf development. Uh, over here you see uh, dev various uh, developmental stages of a single leaf. Uh, so the leaf starts off as a tiny primordia, and it grows. Uh, mainly by cell division and cell expansion. Uh, so when, when does the uh, leaf stop? I mean, so initial uh, cell division occurs pre, uh, generally in the, in the earlier stages, and cell expansion occurs at the later stages. So how does the cells know to when to stop dividing and start expanding? Uh, so it occurs at a narrow window of, uh, of developmental stages. So wherein, uh, so you have here, uh, this blue spots which indicate cell division. So the, the cells, they, when they stop dividing, uh, so the recession of the cell division occurs from the tip of the leaf towards the base of the leaf. So when the recession uh, uh, sweeps down to the base, then the cells will stop uh, dividing and they start expanding. So from this stage till the, this stage, the growth major, uh, predominantly occurs by cell expansion. And, uh, by, and by expanding, it attains a particular size and shape. So what is less obvious uh, is the flatness of the leaf. So all the leaves, majority in aerosis, they're near flat. I mean, they have zero curvature, in other words. Mathematically, it has been studied. Uh, wherein, suppose you have a flat circular disk, and if it grows uniformly, you would get a uh, flat, bigger flat circular disk. 
uh, which would have a zero Gaussian curvature technically. It will have a ratio, a particular ratio of, uh, uh, with respect to perimeter and area. Uh, suppose if the growth uh, grows, uh, occurs at, at the periphery, uh, then the perimeter would increase compared to the area, then you will have a higher uh, ratio. Contrary, if you have a growth more at the center, then you would have a ball-shaped or cup-shaped structure, or a technically called Poston Gaussian curvature. So, uh, so uh, in wildlife, generally we have flat leaves, in other words, zero Gaussian curvature. But are there uh, genes which control, uh, which make sure the leaves are flat? Uh, the first, uh, in, a, in, a, in one of the first elegant studies, uh, an, a gene was isolated. So in the mutation of this gene, you, you tend to get these uh, curly leaves, uh, which, are, which is a good example of negative Gaussian curvature. As you can see here, there is more growth in the periphery, so there is a higher perimeter compared to the area. Uh, and, uh, and this is what is shown in this carton. So the question would be, uh, uh, so are there genes which control the opposite, whether the, uh, which can control positive Gaussian curvature, which make sure the leaves are, uh, are flat? So I started with this. Uh, so we did an EMS metagenesis screen in Aerobsys, and uh, <coughs> we found a mutant, which we named it as Tharani, uh, wherein you can see that the leaves are cup-shaped. Uh, and uh, so what we uh, did was we, we tried to see the cell division, uh, how it is occurring acro uh, across the medial lateral axis. So this is from the midrib towards the periphery. So And what you see is, in the case of wild type, where the cell division progressively declines. So as you move from the mid towards the, uh, from the mid midrib towards the edge of the lamina, whereas in the case of the mutant, it actually peaks and then slowly recites. So in other words, the, cell, uh, the cells uh, divide for a longer period of time as well as more in the medial region, and that's why you're getting cup-shaped leaves. Uh, so, we <laughs> so we mapped this uh, mutant, uh, and it found to, it found, it's revealed to be a ubiquitinase. Uh, this is the intron exon structure of, that, uh, of the gene. Uh, the mutation lies ex in the third intron and the fourth uh, exon junction. So it's somewhere here, it's, it's a G2A transition, and because of which, uh, actually, the intron doesn't get spliced out because of the inefficient splicing. So ideally, we would expect a frame shift or a stop codon uh, because of this intron, but it doesn't happen that way. So you do get a protein uh, which has some excess of this. And we have shown that it is this form of the protein which is caused for the phenotype which has, which has seen earlier. And we have asked various other developmental questions. Thanks. Audible. Yeah. I am Sandeep. I am working with Dr. Ravikant's lab in A3. Uh, uh, yeah. For my PhD, I am trying to trace the center of origin of Piper nigrum, which is black pepper, which belongs to the genus Piper and belong to the family Piper uh, This is a cartoon which depicts my central question and the different multidisciplinary approaches which I'm trying to uh, trying to use for to trace the origin. So right now I am in that part where I'm looking at the history uh, and sitting in archives and looking at different uh, uh, looking at the different theories what tells about center of origin and domestication history of Piper nigrum. Then, uh, and I'll, then I'll be going to the uh, doing some distribution models and looking at phylogeny and population genetics. So uh, this is a global distribution of genus Piper, where you'll find a lot of uh, species centered around neotropics, then in Asian tropics, and in South Pacific and the uh, African uh, tropics. So this uh, this actually tells a dispersal from. Uh, neotropics to the uh, Asian tropics. So to test that, we developed a global phylogeny from uh, using other, uh, some sample sequences from NCBI. So we found all the Indian species which include the uh, that particular clade, which has Piper nigrum nested within the Southeast Asia. And then we are planning to uh, put two fossils here, which has been recently found from the neotropics. And which is an in-group fossil belong to the clade called Shilaria, and uh, 
our group fossil from the South Pacific and try and find out when this dispersal has happened. So then going to my uh, main question, I, I look at several theories which says Piper Niagara has originated in Western Ghats. Some Southern Western Ghats, they've come from uh, Molucas Island from Southeast Asia. So what I'm thinking of sampling throughout the, the distribution when the, where the wild piper is found, now I've screened some microsatellite markers for that, around 10 nuclear and three CPSSRs. So then as a starting point, I'll try to look at the population structure and look at the areas where more haplotypes is found. Thanks. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Sharda from Kavita's lab. In my work, we Uh, in my work, we considered the adaptation of an asexual population on a rugged fitness landscape, which has multiple local fitness peaks, like this one and this one. So now I will talk about the average number of beneficial mutations that get fixed in this population as it moves to one of these peaks. To study this, we consider the adaptive walk model, which assumes strong selection and weak mutation. Uh, because of these assumptions, the whole population is constrained to a single sequence and can move to any, I mean, only it's another sequence, which is a mutation away. I mean, as schematically depicted here. Here, a darker color corresponds to a higher fitness. So starting from the sequence, it's possible for the population to move from here to here and finally end up here or take a different path. And the average number of mutations that happen, we call it the walk length. Now, I mean, in this step, for example, we see that there's more than one beneficial mutation available. And which one of these will get fixed depends on the selection coefficient, as uh, proposed by Haldane, linearly. And the fitness of the sequence themselves we take from uh, either a truncated exponential or a power law distribution for reasons that I'm not going into in right now. And when we use this uh, transition probability and those fitness distributions, we could get an analytical expression for the average walk length. And I mean, from this figure, I mean, and we could sort of uh, uh, we verify it with simulations as well. And the first, I mean, the obvious thing that comes up from this figure is that when the fitness distribution has an infinite mean, then the walk length becomes independent of the initial fitness. Whereas when it's, uh, when the uh, mean is finite, then the walk length has a, I mean, depends logarithmically on the initial fitness, I mean, the rank of the initial fitness. Now, uh, sorry. Now if you were to fix a uh, initial fitness rank, and then we move down, we see that the truncated distribution has a uh, longer walk compared to the exponential, which is longer compared to the power, uh, power law distribution. And the trend of this changes when we consider a more accurate transition probability as proposed by uh, Kimura. And here we see that for the same rank as we moved on, as in the previous case, the walk length decreases when we move from the truncated to the exponential. But while moving from the exponential to the power law, the walk length uh, increases again. So it's a non-monotonic behavior. And then there is no uh, transition at all. I mean, for all distributions, depending on the initial fitness, the walk length changes. Now, coming to experiments, I mean, experiments have been done to measure the uh, walk length. And there is, I mean, there are a few works, I mean, especially this Kassen group's work which find that the walk length is in, seems to be independent of the initial fitness. So no matter what the initial fitness is, the walk length seems to be a constant, which is inconsistent with theoretical expectations. So we probably think there is some point missing here. And, and there are other experiments, for example, this Wickman's group, uh, where the walk length changes with the initial fitness. And for this uh, uh, transition probability, the results shown here are just simulation results. We don't have the analytical expression for it so far, and this is something that we are still working on. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Sona from Kavita Jain's lab. So uh, what I'm interested is to study uh, the effect of beneficial mutations in asexual population. 
So when we allow a well-adapted population to accumulate mutation, as we all know, since beneficial mutations are very rare, if you assume that beneficial mutations are completely absent, the population will accumulate deleterious mutation and go to a very low fitness. That is what Muller's ratchet uh, works. But when we, uh, when we allow a small fraction of beneficial mutation to occur, it attain an equilibrium. So the question we are asking is where or at what fitness it attain this equilibrium. More specifically, we want to measure the number of deleterious mutations at this equilibrium. So such measures are done in uh, problems like codon bias, where we, we are interested in knowing the number of unbi uh, unpreferred codons in the population. So they, they observe such kind of distributions in experiments. So the question I'm interested in is, can we predict such a distribution using a mathematical model? Or can we say something about the average number of unpreferred codon, how it depends on other population genetic parameters? So for that, I consider a mathematical model called Lee-Burmer model, where I consider a haploid asexual population of finite size and genome length L where the evolution happens in a multiplicative fitness landscape. And I group my population into fit, uh, mutant classes, like one mutant in one class, two mutant in another class. And the population can move from one class to other with the, uh, by mutations. And the mutation rate, unlike the previous studies, the mutation rate in this case depends on the number of mutations you are now carrying. So using this model, I, I measure the average number of mutation with population size, and we observe three interesting regimes there. Initially, when the population size is very small, the average number of deleterious mutations is almost a constant. Then it starts decreasing logarithmically for a range of values, and it goes to an exponential regime. So this logarithmic dependence, we believe that uh, this weak dependence in population size can explain the similar level of codon bias seen in populations of different sizes. So presently, what I'm trying to measure is the distribution. To measure the distribution, we actually mapped our model to a well-known statistical mechanical model called zero range process, uh, where we managed to get some distribution in the case of uh, selection, no selection. But I'm still working on the case when there is a weak selection. We are trying to do it perturbatively. Thank you. Uh, I am Shrudip Tatum from Aysar Pune. I am working with Dr. Sutit Dek. Uh, today, I will be talking about uh, one of our model we constructed to predict the dynamics of laboratory population of Drosophila. And from this model, if we can get any insight behind the mechanistic reason of uh, evolution of population stability, particularly constancy stability. So uh, briefly, the features of this model, it is a straight structured, uh, individual-based discrete generation. A uh, model with in intermediate model complexity involving only uh, only a uh, few parameters, uh, some parameters like hatchability, critical body mass for the larvae, adult body size, fecundity, which are very common in other metabolous insects also. So directly I'll go to the uh, model validation. We validate this model, obviously using Androsophila population, uh, uh, present in uh, Bangal JNCSR Bangalore. Uh, this is the uh, po one population uh, in glass vial with some amount of larval and adult food. So uh, depending on the amount of food we are giving to the larvae and adult, we can create four such inhibition regimes. And then we can study the dynamics in those four regimes. So in this particular case, we have uh, done eight replicates in each regime with 49 uh, generations uh, of time series we have generated for each of the replicates. Then uh, exactly uh, in the same way, we have modeled the, simulated the model with explicit uh, high and low food for larvae and adults. So uh, all total, we'll get from experiment and simulation, we'll get uh, 32 time series in each. Then we have calculated these five statistical probes uh, uh, of those uh, 64 time series and plotted in this four uh, five-dimensional space. And then we take the cross-section along the uh, the, along those two axes where uh, we are getting capturing most of the variation in the data. So across this F1 and F2 axis, we are uh, almost capturing 97% of the variation. So interestingly, we can see that uh, if you look, uh, this E means experiment and S means 
uh, simulations. And these uh, each points are the each time series. So all the replicates for one particular regime are clustering together that we can see. And also four experimental clusters are very different, uh, indicating four distinct uh, characteristic dynamics corresponding to the four di different evolutionary regimes. Interestingly, we can get uh, all these two results from the simulation data also. And uh, uh, on addition of that, we can get great uh, overlap with the simulation uh, clusters with the corresponding experimental clusters. So which uh, says that model agrees the experiment. So then uh, we explored the model parameter regime, uh, model parameter space. Uh, one of the key parameter that is critical body mass, which is the minimum amount of body mass required for successful pupation for the larvae. If we vary that parameter, and for each parameter value, if we vary the basal female fecundity, then we can see uh, that uh, irrespective of larval food, with both high uh, we get high amount of fluctuation index. Fluctuation index is one uh, indicator of stabil uh, stability. So high fluctuation means uh, low stability, and uh, low fluctuation means high stability. So uh, irrespective of larval food, we can see uh, if we reduce these two, then we can get uh, higher stability. Interestingly, in one selected model organism, uh, selected line of Drosophila, uh, we did see this uh, lower level of critical mass and basal female fecundity. And we model exactly in the same way this control uh, parameters were same. We just reduce these two. And uh, we model the FEJ population. And we have seen that for very uh, different two in nutritional regimes, LH and HL, uh, we get uh, do get uh, stability in reduced fluctuation index means enhanced stability for selected lines. Hence, reduction of critical body mass and basal female fecundity uh, can explain the evolution of constancy stability in this study. Hence, the model works. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Swastika. I'm a part of the Tribolium uh, group at the Adaptation Lab at NCBS. And I'm going to talk about uh, a small experiment that I designed and conducted to uh, better understand uh, how uh, performance of fitness in a particular resource uh, could be related to larval resource preference in uh, red flower beetles. So uh, we use fecundity data as a proxy for fitness in seven different media and for def seven different populations. And then we selected the best and the worst resources um, and um, provided larvae with a choice of these resources and sort of tracked their positions uh, and recorded them for uh, every 12 hours for about 72 hours, by which time most of them pupate. Um, also, in order to eliminate the possibility of uh, observing trends uh, solely due to uh, movement by larvae across the plate, we introduced uh, some uh, single resource uh, controls. So um, what do we see? Um, we notice that there is no difference in movement in general between populations in uh, single resource controls. Mm, but we do see different resource preference and choice. Uh, therefore, um, the choices made, they're not simply reflecting a differential movement by the populations and are, in fact, what we do notice is actual choice. And it seems like most populations uh, choose the best resource over the worst resource, except for one population which chooses the worst resource in both cases. Um, however, this may have been due to the texture of that particular resource, which uh, typically beetles don't like. So um, it's sort of reassuring to note that most of the larvae are pretty smart, and they're choosing the best resource. Uh, but the larvae that don't do that, make you think about what else could um, be affecting preference. Are there any sort of um, olfactory cues that the larvae are getting from the media? Uh, could the texture or the moisture content or any other such physical characteristic be affecting preference? Um, is proximity to the resource somehow important? And um, right now, we're sort of um, thinking about these questions and looking for ways to sort of um, um, tease apart these different aspects related to level preference. Um, Okay, so I'm grateful to everyone on this slide and in this room for this opportunity. Thank you.
Hi, this is Vinesh from Aisno Mohali. I'm a student of Dr. Prasad. I'm going to talk about one of the recent experiments that, that we did in our lab, uh, which demonstrates the evolution of certain aspects of uh, reproductive behavior in flies. So uh, these populations are large, orbit, and uh, they are about uh, 130 plus generations old. The ancestral populations ca are called MBs, and the uh, selected populations ca are called MCUs. So the MCUs are clouded as ra uh, larvae, and uh, they differ only in the uh, larva density that they are maintained at. So that like, uh, MBs are uh, reared at 70x in 6 ml of food, where M MCUs are uh, reared at 800x uh, in about 1.5 ml of food. So uh, keeping the is it working? Yeah. Uh, so uh, keeping the Y model of resource allocation in mind, uh, uh, we ask this question: What changes uh, occur in the reproductive behavior when we rear the uh, flies at different densities? So uh, in this particular experiment design, <clears throat> to check uh, what we call as a courtship frequency. Uh, so uh, all of you must be knowing about the courtship behavior, that, uh, which is very important in the flies. It is one of the most uh, important and most well-studied behavior of uh, uh, fruit flies. And uh, <coughs> to assay this, what we did, we had uh, two def uh, different density treatments, 60 and six, uh, 600 eggs per while. And when the flies are closed, uh, we transfer them into cages. And uh, later on, uh, we make factorial combinations of different males and females, uh, <coughs> then use them and check for courtship activity. So what we found here uh, is that there's a significant effect of male type, uh, as well as there's an effect of density, as well as uh, uh, male, uh, male cross-density interaction. What it means uh, is that the MCUs, the selected population, they have uh, evolved higher courtship activity. Uh, so these are the MCUs and MBs. Uh, and that plot shows the uh, same result density-wise. So you can see at uh, both densities, MCUs are, have a higher courtship activity. Uh, so to summarize, uh, uh, they have developed overall uh, high, higher courtship activity, but we don't know why this happens because uh, we, uh, you know, uh, keeping the Y model in mind, uh, <coughs> one of the earlier experiments that we did showed that uh, MCUs have evolved a higher longevity. So the mechanism and the reason for this uh, particular result is still under investigation. Hello? Yeah, uh, so I'm Vishaka, I'm a student of Sandeep, and uh, for the last month or so, I've been thinking about the evolution of transcriptional regulatory networks, and this is in collaboration with Mukund and uh, Ashok Venkatraman at Cambridge. So, so by a regulatory network, I just mean a transcription factor or a set of transcription factors that bind uh, the promoters of different genes and influence their production. So in this hypothetical network here, in some species Y, uh, the transcription factor A, um, binds the genes, the promoters of genes B and D and alters their production. So the question I'm interested in is how long does it take for a network like this to evolve? And specifically, if I can calculate this, if I can estimate this time, is it possible for me to tell if this network evolved through selection or through drift? Uh, no, networks rarely come out of nowhere. So, uh, so, what, so what I plan to do is uh, I look at the ancestor of this species and I look at how the regulatory network connects the same genes in this ancestor. And uh, essentially, if, this dist if I know the phylogenetic branch length between these two species, uh, can I calculate how long it takes for the network in X to evolve to the network in Y through mutations in the binding sites of these genes? Uh, so, the, so one way of doing this is you know, I take the phylogenetic branch length between these two species. And I estimate the time it takes for all the mutations to go from species X to species Y purely through drift. And the way I do this is uh, I simply compute the likelihood of different mutational paths from X to Y. So uh, in here, uh, one way of going from X to Y is there are mutations which have no fitness effect in the promoters of B, C, and D. 
or it could evolve through a more whacked out way and maybe there's a gene maybe the uh, the gene a duplicates and then there are mutations in different promoters to get to the same path so in some sense uh, if I calculate the likelihood of evolution through these different paths, I can get an estimate of how long it takes for this network to evolve through drift. So once I get this estimate, I can compare this to the phylogenetic branch length between these species. And uh, we know for sure that positive selection tends to speed up the acquisition uh, of, 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 of genes. So in all likelihood, if the drift-based estimate that we compute is much, much longer than the actual phylogeny distance between these two species, that is some proof that the binding sites of B, C, and D, in this case, were under some sort of positive selection. Whereas if the estimates are comparable, it's very hard to rule out uh, the effects of drift. Uh, now, uh, interestingly, uh, a great model system where we're going to test this idea is actually cancer. Um, and cancer is a great model system to actually look at network evolution. Uh, so one of the reasons is that uh, the cancers that we have from uh, Ashok's group at Cambridge, they possess a crazy mutator phenotype. Uh, and, this, and this mutator phenotype can be switched on experimentally at any point. Secondly, tumors represent sort of asexual uh, clonal expansion within, uh, within a tumor. Uh, and also, genes in mice and humans tend to have extremely long promoters. And it makes it very likely for us to observe the gain and loss of transcription factor binding sites. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Yashida. I have just recently enrolled into a PhD program in the University of Mumbai. Um, I, my main interests are in um, behavioral ecology and specifically in insect communication, um, more specifically in um, uh, male sex pheromones in different butterfly species. So as of now, I intend to work on uh, various populations of butterfly species uh, and also look at uh, the variations that are involved in the male sex pheromones of these. Uh, male sex pheromones are actually very interesting because uh, they are extremely important for speciation and for species recognition. So the female would know that this is the male of my own species through the sex pheromones. Um, so you would want them actually to be conserved um, uh, over time, but then you also find a lot of variation because you have so many species. So anyway, what I uh, intend to look at is um, what could be the ecological or environmental drivers um, for this variation that we find in the MSPs, um, such as, say, sexual selection? Um, could it be uh, the larval rearing temperatures? Could it be um, the larval diet or the nectars, the nectar diets? And uh, possibly even look at what kind of variation exists across populations, if at all there is variation. So as of now, I don't have any data on this. Um, I've just begun my work. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. So uh, I've, I've jotted down a few more or less random thoughts about what might principles may or may not have emerged <laughs> from this meeting, and um, I, I, you know, I don't want to monopolize the conversation. So um, you know, please, if somebody wants to s say something, I suggest it's probably easiest if they come up to the front and grab the mic from me. <laughs> Pardon? Okay, well, yeah, <laughs> we, can, we can have a fight, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, I, I wrote down a few notes. Um, so, one, one, one point uh, and that we might want to think about is, is that selection is not always on obvious sort of traits like body size or mating behavior or, or something like that. Uh, and you know, quite a lot of population genetics models of, say, genome evolution involve, uh, as it came out in, in one of Deborah's lectures, things like the, the what you might call, think of as a transmission advantage of a gene. So in the simplest cases, asexual reproduction. That may spread in a population not because it's conferring uh, higher survival or fertility on individuals, but it's because switching from being a female who produces half males and half females, you get an automatic reproductive advantage if you produce all females. And that's, that's a rather crude example, but there are many more. 
in, in the literature on genome evolution. And it can be used to explain some quite interesting uh, things like the evolution, say, of haplodiploid insects. So, um, uh, so that, I think that's a, a, a principle which, which people might want to, to bear in mind um, if they're thinking about evolution, especially of different types of mating systems or breeding systems. Um, I don't know if Deborah wants to comment on that. Do we? Uh, you mentioned genome evolution, but there are um, forces um, acting within genomes that we can't see at the visible phenotypic level that might uh, have some of the same um, properties like um, transmission advantages. You mentioned, I think, the um, segregation distortion. Yeah? Um, but there are other, um, and, and, and a gene conversion. So there are various things that might be put into that same box and category. And, and I just <coughs> dealt with breeding systems because that's what I work on and, and it gives examples of that. But I tried to say, and I think it's true, that there are several contexts in which selection is going on, not just at what's obvious. Does anybody want to comment on, on this? Um. Uh, okay, <laughs> well, we'll move on to the next topic that I got on my list. Uh, uh, ah, what is fitness? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, that, that, that's a good idea. Uh, uh, I mean, we've talked a lot about, you know, very simple minded models of fitness, you know, incredibly crude, uh, either single generation, discrete generation models of where, you know, uh, as uh, Anatole France once summed up the history of humanity, they are born, they suffer, and they die. Um, so organisms are born, they have a little bit of fun, they reproduce, and then they die. That's the model of discrete generations. And in between there's some suffering, that's natural selection on survival. Um, so, uh, but there are more subtle modes of, of um, organizing your life history. And that's not something that's been discussed more, more than touched on. Uh, actually, there was one of the student talks mentioned stage structure model, um, and that's, that's certainly an important thing in evolutionary ecology. Uh, I've worked uh, uh, some time on what happens with age-structured populations. Humans and Drosophila are excellent examples of organisms which are, are born. They spend a period of time as juveniles. They then become adults, and they have some, some um, some, some reproductive success, uh, that tends to decline with age, and mortality tends to go up with age. So that's an interesting problem in evolutionary biology, and I think there I have, uh, I've had a conversations with a few people about, you know, why is it that, that, why is it that we age? And actually, you know, some quite good population genetic models which show that, in fact, the selective impact of a gene is higher if it's expressed earlier in life than it is. Uh, if it's expressed late in life. I mean, uh, anybody who's experienced the Bangalore traffic will realize that however skilled you are, sooner or later you're going to get run over by a rickshaw or a bus or a motorbike. <laughs> so if you wait long enough, you, the, the gene which is expressed uh, after that happens is not going to have any impact on fitness. And that's basically the explanation for, for, for the evolution of, of, or thought to be the uh, explanation of the evolution of aging. So I think that you know there, there are subtle aspects of, of fitness which are not dealt with in the sort of standard discrete generation models or the continuous time, you know, DP by DT models, which people working on experimental evolution often like to, like to make. Anybody want to comment on that? <laughs> it's not much of a discussion. Uh, yeah, please. I d let's have a discussion, not yeah, listen to me yeah. talk. Well, I wonder um, um, generation times and age structured. So there, there are ways in which these topics connect to many different applications that I think are interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. It also um, may also affect uh, the X-linked genes versus autosomal genes. That they, they X-linked gene is transmitted in uh, two thirds of its time in females and one third of its time in males. So it's going to, if there is an elevated male mutation rate. 
uh, it's going to, which, which is associated with this increase in mutation rate uh, with age in, in males, in humans, which is where it's best documented, uh, you, you, you'll get a, a higher mutation rate for autosomal and Y-linked genes than you will with, with, uh, with um, X-linked genes. And there's evidence for male, elevated male mutation rates in various organisms, mammals, birds, and even, I think, in Silene, right? Your, your dioecious plant. Uh, and that's, of course, related to the much larger number of cell divisions that happen between zygote to zygote uh, in the male germline than the female germline. Um, doesn't seem to be much of a player around with software, I'm happy to say there's not such a big difference. Uh, but that's certainly something which you know one should bear in mind. There's not such a thing as a, a constant mutation rate or a, uh, a, a global mutation rate across the genome. And uh, people like Adam A. Walker have been arguing recently that there may be very subtle variations in mutation rates. For, uh, what, what does he call it? Cryptic? Cryptic variation in mutation rate. I don't quite know how I can detect something which is cryptic, but he claims to detect it. <laughs> sort of my, my, my pet uh, subject, right? So I, I'd like to un understand better uh, about models that include some demographic or ecological parameters and into understanding, you know, we assume these constant n, constant mu, constant all kinds of stuff. Great to start us off with because I could not understand any more complicated stuff than that in, in a week. But um, I, I'm curious to know what happens if we include dynamics, temporal and spatial dynamics, and, and Mike talked about some of these, and I think Richard will talk about some of these ideas in his talk in the next couple of days. Um, uh, but I think those sort of moving away from constancy in general in different parameters would be really great to know um, how that affects our, our predictions about how evolution the outcomes will change. Um, Hello. That if we uh, constrain, if we put a constraint early in age on a mosquito's life, so it will uh, leads to uh, advantageous mutations in the lifetime of that mosquito. So the people should um, put the insecticides in uh, later stages of the mosquito's life, so that the mutations cannot accumulate in the population. So I think that early uh, when we um, when we introduce constraints in a population at an early age, it leads to accumulation of favorable mutation to that population at an early stage. So that will uh, spread in the population more likely as compared to the constraint which is introduced to the population at its latest, it means at its older age. So, so in mos I just wanted to add this information. In mosquitoes, these people are uh, using this concept of uh, mutations occurring depending on the age of the population. I did. I, can't, I don't know how to say it anymore. Uh, we're just uh, uh, pulling a few of these things together is the, the notion that the, the consequences of the genes acting in a particular individual often go beyond the time frame of that individual's life, right? So you, you couldn't understand, for example, uh, um, the evolution of cell thing unless you're trying to track what happens as a consequence in the next generation and, the, for example, the embryo depression that happens in the next generation. You can't really understand uh, evolution of social evolution, you know, Hamilton's rule, unless you track, and this is where it went wrong for a while, unless you track the the ecological consequences of the competition that might occur later, you, you can't understand some, uh, you know, epi the, the, the genes that cause epigenetic single signals unless you understand how that affects the uh, reproductive success of the offspring and the, uh, of, of that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You, you can't understand the, the consequences of effective population size from structured populations unless you think about the correlated effects of anything that happens in one generation over multiple time frames. So I, th I think there's issue after issue after issue that comes up in evolutionary biology, where even if we think about discrete generations and keep that simple, y you still can't understand 
the cool part of evolution without thinking on a multi-generation scale. And I'm not sure we don't have, I mean, we have ways of doing that, but it, we, we're, they're, they're not easy and they're, we're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not good at doing that yet, I think. The same with the, <laughs> and we have consequences that, that persist over multiple generations. And unless you account for that in your ecological model, you're not fully gonna understand the evolutionary e ecology uh, interaction. Okay, I, um, perhaps I can start a fight now. Um, something I was thinking about, because we've had a lot of very interesting material on uh, experimental evolution, um, and there's been a, a, a tremendous emphasis on experimental evolution of asexual populations, though we did get a brief mention by John of Drosophila, as, a, uh, which as far as I last worked on Drosophila, it was sexual. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, but you, you bloody well ignored it, yes. Uh, so, uh, of course, most organisms, even including bacteria in a state of nature, actually have some recombination. So uh, there's a kind of, well, there's two issues, I think, and I'd, I'd like to get Michael's response to this. I'm sure he'd be more than happy. Uh, uh, one is uh, the lack of recombination. So that actually makes life quite difficult for predicting the course of evolution. Um, I mean, in, in the traditional sort of modeling of evolution of uh, quantitative traits um, for evolutionary purposes and also for animal breeders has made a great deal of use of the idea that basically everything's evolving independently of everything else. And when you do have recombination, uh, then Jim Crow has been a very uh, uh, forceful advocate to the idea that basically, you know, going back to Fisher, it's the additive effects of genes which matter. Mutations are distributed across, you know, what's going on at other sites in the genome in a very random sort of way. And that's why Fisher's fundamental theorem, essentially, for sexually reproducing organisms works on the additive genetic variants. You can forget about all this epistatic rubbish and just throw it in the dustbin. I mean, the epistasis is there, but it's not, not being used by selection, in a sense. Um, right? Your response to selection is determined by the... the the covariance between the additive effects of the genes and their additive effects on fitness. Um, so, in fact, uh, he had a student, Russell Malmberg, back in the 70s, who compared the response of what was happening in asexual populations of some T, I think it was a T even phage being selected for resistance to, to the flavins which induce uh, frame shift mutations, and then compare what's happening in a sexual population and an asexual population. And uh, I've never seen to cite this paper, but it's quite an interesting contrast because there are lots of epistatic effects popping up in the asexually selected ones, but not the sexually selected ones. So I think that, you know, it's something we should bear in mind that, you know, that there's, a, there's a difference between what's going on when you have lots of recombination and when you don't have recombination, and one, one should bear that in mind when interpreting you know, these asexual experiments we've been hearing quite a lot about. Uh, there's also another point about experimental evolution, which is time scale. I was arguing in my talk on Thursday that you know, the selective effects of a large number of things are very, very weak. And when you're running an experimental evolution thing, you're, you know, even if you're as mad as a rich landscape, you run it for 60,000 generations. But often we're talking about time scales of say a thousand generations. If we go back to the sort of most basic uh, calculation of how long it takes to shift things, you're not only going to get a substantial shift in the allele frequency if the selection coefficient is, say, of the order of, at you know, can't be much smaller than one percent, right, uh, from Hallane's equations. So, you know, when people, you know, say, "Well, I've got mutations of big effects popping up in the experiments," they're not going to see anything else, right? <laughs> So you're actually looking at one, one end of the distribution. If you could run the experiment for a million generations, who knows what we'd see. Maybe it's technically going to be possible. But yeah, so I think there's you know, two things there which are different to experimental evolution. Uh, well, three things. As, as John mentioned, the Drosophila experiments are being run with lots of standing variation. And that's another thing which is different. When you're relying on new mutations to come in from a, a single clone, which has got nothing there, I think that you know you may well see quite different patterns of evolution, even in asexual lineages, than when, when you, you've got uh, lots of variation. There. Do you want to come and have a fight, Michael? <laughs>
population and microbes, I mean like any other sort of model system that we might think about, like thinking about Drosophila population genetics, you know, it's a good model for some things and a bad model for others. And, you know, we should think carefully about the limitations of the, of the model systems and, you know, just like, you know, Drosophila population geneticist, genetics tells us some things relevant for humans and other things are quite different. It's certainly the same, same, uh, same story with experiments. I'll just sort of say sort of just one personal thing about, about this issue of sexual versus asexual um, yeast evo uh, evolution experiments. I mean, this I have to say is like one of the, so far the, the you know, biggest repeated failures uh, that, that, that I've managed to just go after again and again. I first got into yeast uh, experimental evolution rather than working in bacteria because you know yeast in principle you can maintain them both sexually and asexually in the laboratory you can maintain them uh, as haploids or as diploids and you can explore a lot more of these sort of you know complicated more complicated effects that are relevant for it's a eukaryotic system so you can explore some some effects that are more relevant for eukaryotes um, I have attempted to run evolution experiments in sexual laboratory populations of yeast, varying recombination rates by just changing timing of sexual cycles. You know, in principle, you can get these guys to have sex whenever you want. In practice, oh man, you know, it is a pain in the ass. Um, these guys do not like to have sex in the lab. And you can try, um, and I have tried, and, um, you know, they're just cranky, you know? I mean, I don't know what else to say. Like, um, you know, there's selection acting directly on ploidy. There is selection to lose sporulation ability. There's selection for um, uh, haploids to lose the ability to mate. Um, and so it's just really hard to maintain long-term sexually evolving lines. So I have a postdoc who, you know, really, I guess, um, didn't have the good sense to learn from my previous failures and has um, built a really complicated genetic system where he can uh, take yeast, um, anyway, I don't want to get into all the details of it. He's built some really crazy stuff that basically kills yeast in eight different ways if they don't have, if they're not haploid and diploid at the right times. And so we're trying again. But uh, it remains to be seen whether we'll succeed or it'll be another failure. Um, but in general, like you know, we can you know some of the answers to these to these issues are going to be technical, like this, right? Evolution experiments can be certainly extended to address other issues that you know have not been addressed much in the past, like you know the effect of of varying rates of recombination. Um, so that's sort of you know one sort of. Um, thing to uh, one sort of direction in which progress can be made. You know, the two other things are just that, you know, this is like any other, just some simple model system which is good at addressing some situations and not others. And, you know, I would certainly argue that just understanding uh, evolution and population genetics in situations, scenarios relevant for microbes is really important and underappreciated. I mean, now there's a sort of great expansion of, uh, of, of work in this area, but I mean, I would guess, I, w I guess I would also argue that I don't really care often. I mean, I do care, but I mean, I can at least make the argument that it's things like this, that we care way too much about population genetics of higher eukaryotic sexual systems and way too little about population genetics of, of microbes and viruses, which are really important for a lot of things that we care about. I mean, obviously there's tons of microbial pathogens. Uh, you know, we're learning all about the importance of the microbiome in our own health and in the you know, productivity of crops and all sorts of things. And you know, there is a, a really interesting and thriving field of microbial population genetics, but I mean, compared with the amount of effort that's gone into human and Drosophila population genetics relative to their to their importance, you know, I would argue that there's a need for these kinds of, of model systems, which are not trying to say anything about stuff that's relevant for humans, but are just trying to directly ask questions about microbes. On the, the epistasis issue, and, and uh, you know, in your talk, you were getting at some of the experimental approaches that you've taken and, and preliminary results that 
hint in different ways and maybe one of the things I think we should think a little bit about I, I'm you know all of this sort of uh, thinking about epistasis in terms of population genetics is is well and good um, I think there should be a little bit more thinking now um, about epistasis just in terms of physiology right so like I mean, all of this epistasis that we see in our experiments is basically a signature of how yeast is wired. Like, how are the genetic networks of yeast wired? I mean, it's, you know, it's a, we can argue about, you know, Fisher's view and all this kind of stuff for a long time. People have been arguing about it for a long time. But at the end of the day, really, you know, some of these things are empirical questions about about the physiology of, you know, the organization of genetic networks in yeast and, and, and other organisms and humans and anything. And, uh, and, you know, that's where epistasis comes from, and or at least one of the places where epistasis com comes from. And, you know, I think there's going to be a... I think there could be some uh, benefit from you know, evolutionary biologists interacting a bit more with molecular biologists uh, to address this kind of issue. Of which um, might be more tractable in experimental evolution. They might also be more important in um, natural populations, um, or at least of interest in, in relation to broad evolutionary questions that we want to answer. They may, they may be good model systems out there that could benefit from the resources we have in the laboratory model systems. And I think that's another thing for the younger people here to bear in mind, that um, there are all sorts of um, organisms that are understudied, and fungi generally um, are quite tractable systems, often where we have a lot of expertise in genetics and how to culture them, and how to work with them, and what they do, and what might be important for fitness in those organisms, and yet they're not being studied in evolutionary terms. We tend to study things which are pretty and attractive and visible, at least to people who are good at seeing things like birds. Um, but we shouldn't neglect these other organisms. There are interesting things. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with both of you. I mean, I, I was just trying to stir things up a bit. I mean. I remember when I was at the University of Sussex, we had what I called the fur feather syndrome, which was if somebody gave a talk on a mammal or a bird, you'd pack the lecture room. If somebody gave a talk on you know, population genetics, it would be John Maynard Smith, me, Deborah, and one or two hangers on, you know. So, <laughs> uh, and, uh, so you know, I, I do think uh, there are important questions dealing with, with all kinds of organisms which have weird breeding systems. Uh, you know, there's a lot of self highly self-fertilizing organisms, let alone um, uh, asexual organisms, uh, and that's getting very close to asexuality, but not quite the same. And you know, th th these differences have do have profound consequences for the way they evolve. So, you know, I think it's important to bear that in mind. You you can't just extrapolate straightforwardly from random mating populations to every creature on the planet. So, subdivided populations and you know changes in population size the thing which always worries me when you have these statistical genetics models i mean you you'll only get out of the model the assumptions that you put in at the beginning i mean you have a there must be an infinite number of ways demography happens but you you put in a model you know the population stable it goes up then it settles down uh, and it does better than one where it's constant but obviously you can't compare every possible range of model um, is this a, a big problem or is it not? Yeah, so um, it's, yeah, it's a great question. So um, many of the approaches that we take are, are parametric models where we say, okay, I think there's been one bottleneck and I want to estimate when it began and, and what the size was during the bottleneck of the population. Um, there are a branch of methods that are getting away from that that infer population size trajectories through time as a, as a step function or as a continuous valued function. Um, one challenge there is that uh, using some approaches like uh, just looking at frequency spectra, you actually have identifiability problems that there is, there are many different trajectories that, that will fit the data. So unless you come in with some restriction of the model space to only models with bottlenecks or only models with bottlenecks and growth, then 
there are you know an infinite number of ways to tweak a, uh, a trajectory to get it to fit the data. Um, that, uh, but that highlights, um, I think, mainly the limitations of frequency spectra data and our modeling abilities. If you th if People have then reacted to some of these. There's been papers, you know, making this point about the identifiability issue with frequency spectra, and and population size trajectories. But um, uh, more recent work has has showed how, if you look at linkage disequilibrium patterns using some of these haplotype based models, you start to break down that Id that identifiability problem and make progress. So I think it's um, the there is a future where we will hopefully be able to develop methods that free us from some of the, the parametric models that we've been fitting. And, um, but uh, even then, you know, th this would be progress that would, you know, what we can hope for in the near future is approaches that get us population size trajectories for a single population. Uh, you, you know, when you start doing multiple populations, it gets much harder. So, um, uh, yeah, so I think you're hitting at real limits in the methods. Um, but it's something that the community of methods people are hacking away at and trying to push back. Um, so I'll, I'll 